concerning the psychology of the artist. For art to be possible at all, a certain preliminary physiological state is indispensable. Ecstasy. This state of ecstasy must first have consumed the whole body, otherwise no art is possible. All kinds of ecstasy, however differently produced, have this power to create art, but above all, the state dependent upon sexual excitement. This is the most venerable and primitive form of ecstasy. Yet the same applies to that ecstasy, which is the outcome of all great desires and strong passions. The ecstasy of the feast, of the arena, of the act of bravery, of victory, of all extreme action. The ecstasy of cruelty, of destruction, the ecstasy following upon certain astral influences, as for instance that of springtime, more upon the use of narcotics. And finally, the ecstasy which results from the accumulated and surging willpower. The essential feature of ecstasy is the feeling of increased strength and abundance. Actuated by this feeling, man forces the things around him to partake in his riches. He does violence to them. This proceeding is called idealizing. In this state, a man enriches everything from out of his own abundance. What he sees, what he wills, he sees distended, compressed, strong, overladen with power. He transfigures things until they reflect his power, until they are stamped with his perfection. This compulsion to transfigure into the beautiful is art. Everything, even that which he is not, is nevertheless to such a man a means of rejoicing over himself. In art, man rejoices over himself as perfection. Ladies and boil men, today we are going to talk about the naughtiest, the nastiest, the screechiest German incel who has ever existed. The sinister simp who sits up on top of nasty mountain cackling as he casts magic spells in his evil books designed to hurt your feelings. But the plot twist, you are intoxicated by this temptation of ultimate power that he promises. He speaks of immense power that he will offer to you and the world and, and you sit there and it's in your library but all the white wizards of the realm have told you never, never open those books or they'll take your soul and, and but, but you, you you have them littered all around you because you know your realm has been taken over by an evil force and so these books sit around in your bookshelf and you're scared. You're scared of opening them because you've seen what happened to the golems of this world. They open these books and then they start to get in this trance and they whisper and they go off into their little cave and they start reading the book over and over again being like, I love this. I love power, my precious, my Nietzsche, my precious. And you don't want that to happen to you. You know, you know that if you open that book, it's not a one-way dialogue. It's not you where you could just get to open that book and read and then go away and not be changed. Not, not something have happened to you. No, it's not that you just get to take something out of the book. Nietzsche sits there on the top of the mean, on top of Mount Doom in the astral plane, and he watches through the book. You know that, like all abysses, when you stare into the books of power, Nietzsche stares back into you. When you open up and read these pages, he whispers, I see. 
So today we're going to do we're go, here on on Uber Boyle, We do the the we do the brave. We we go the lengths that people never go because you know I am a I am a white wizard as well. I, I I'm part of the fellowship. I don't know how I told you, and I know that if you want to defeat Nietzsche, you can't you can't run away. You can't. There's no way around it. You must go to Mount Doom and throw that Zarathustra back into the fires from whence it came. You must do that. You cannot you cannot avoid this. This is a this is a burden I will take on board for you. I will be. I, I don't like, I think Frodo's a loser, but I will be Frodo. I will be your Frodo, and we will carry this book and throw it back into nasty Nietzsche's cackling hellhole that he created there on top of Nasty Mountain. We will do it today. So today we're going to take a, a dive into certain quotes from Twilight of the Idols and their relevance towards the generation of culture. And we're going to take two perspectives on this. The generation of culture that led to the creation of these statues we see everybody pulling down all around the Western Europe. And we're going to look at the generation of culture of um, hip-hop and how that, that the black culture have found in themselves the brilliant and lively animated energy to create this brilliant movement that's become the cultural hegemon, hegemony of the world around us. And we're going to contrast these and see the different places that these two people find themselves in. And of course, the best place to start is with Nietzsche discussing the one thing that he probably never did, nothing, the, the experience of ecstasy, the experience of splurging, you know, he, he probably, maybe he did, see, Nietzsche is a type of guy that you notice with the aphorisms, he tries to go for a one punch knockout, he tries to hit you really hard in your feelings, so maybe he nutted once, and he was so, he's, he's just so good at doing this, he's so passionate and so involved, that not only did he probably get that girl pregnant, and so there's probably a little mini Nietzsche running around, but we don't know about him, but he also got syphilis that ended up killing him, so it was the through this single moment of ecstasy in his entire life he probably he probably uh, achieved apotheosis through I the immortality of of a child and also eventual apotheosis through the immortality of madness and the philosopher that went insane and died it was he is he, i'm telling you he hits very very high no wonder he's up there on the top of nasty mountain is because you, you wouldn't have a crazier man a better suited man you know and so he's going to talk to us about the psychology of the artist and how it relates to um, juice producing. Let's put it this way. So in order to get a firm grip on what Nietzsche is presenting here, you need to take this view of what your soul is is. You need to look at things from this interesting perspective. So take a journey with me for a moment. Imagine that God was sitting there and he's after making the universe, this, you know, cubic box that he's got, this this prism, this whatever thing he's after making and he's after articulating it like an architect. He's put it together. It's like a lovely little palace. It's, you know, the the, the guy who uh, sits around and, and puts together the, the ship inside the bottle and all this type of stuff. And so he's after doing that, but he kind of sits down there and he's kind of itching his head. He's like, oh, just fucking, nothing's happening, you know? There's nothing going on. Like, it's not moving. I'd love if uh, all these, you know, I made all these, like, really cool looking people and all this and all these lovely animals and all this stuff. I'd love if it would do something, you know? And then he looks over at the wall and he sees that he actually put a, made a plug because he's God. He's very smart. He's even smarter than himself. That's how smart God is. And he says, you know what? I could just plug it into the wall in heaven and that will inject this thing full of energy. And then it will start moving, it'll start doing stuff. And then maybe he was thinking to himself, he's like, you know, you know, maybe I'll be able to plug this energy into the wall and it will it will be able to evolve and grow into something more profound in itself. It'll be able to come up and rise itself up to my level and meet me as well. And then I could be friends with it. I could make my I could make a, a being that I, I could love and hang out with, you know. It's almost like he was trying to craft you like a father into something great. But in order to do that, I need to put it in this little cradle, you know. So this little cradle is three-dimensional reality. And of course, he plugs it into the wall and what happens? Whoa, the big bang. And then us, we, before, long before any of us existed as these little forms here, we were all that energy. We were all that energy that that's sh shoving itself through this strange prison that he created and, and, and shuttling through and evolving and turning into stars. And as Neil deGrasse Tyson says, we all star stuff at once. And so we, we were all the stars back then. We were hanging around with each other, being all fiery and all this, like roaring at each other all the time, which I guess not much has changed. And then we um, consolidated over time into Earth. And we were all then in the ocean. This, all this energy had consolidated. E equals MC square. All this energy had consolidated into matter. And this weird energy had consolidated into, of all things, bacteria, the miracle it had happened. The Logos was now moving, you know. 
and all this energy was was driven by its emotions. It was the bacteria wasn't sitting around in cafes stroking its beard, talking about intellectual stuff, being like, "Hey, where do we go from here, gents?" No, not at all. It was all feeling. It was all in its emotions and all that. It is no eyes. It is no ears. It is no nothing. All it has is just this this jolt of moves, like the way worms work. You know, they just wiggle and they just feel their way through things. So it's a very felt experience. Now, God kind of had to do a mistake. He wants us to grow up and become strong ourselves. So we can't, he can't necessarily come down and like hold our hand through every step. He needs to just inject us with a sort of generalized thrust forward. And so this energy, this life, these little bacteria being driven by this energy that has consolidated itself in these little bacteria, it knows that it needs to it needs to get out and you know it needs to expand and evolve that's all it knows that's the one energy the one feeling inside of it that that exists in it somewhere so it has to make sure that there's this weird almost like time limit it's like god made a game where there's this time limit where if you don't make it in time this this evil force of, of death of time of entropy is going to get you and destroy you if you're not good enough you're not sharp enough you don't win on time you will get destroyed because we're trying to we're trying to achieve something here so time is almost like this this evil hand of god that's actually crafting us through death into something more supreme death crafts us into something more beautiful the stone the formless stone gets crafted crafted into the beautiful formed statue through murder through through the sharp hand of the artist you know so god is almost like this artist crafting through these painful feelings the secret truth about god that no one wants to tell you okay and so these bacteria and all this they're they're driven by this feeling and they're trying to clutch onto life but there's also this this time limit where they have to they have to thrive they have to grow as well they have to try overcome constantly overcome this limit so most of them just just try to stay still they just say, "All right, all right, we got this. We landed on this 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 ocean floor. We're good, um, but but don't don't do anything weird. Like we're good here. Just keep you know, be conservative. Just keep keep up. Keep what you're going. Keep doing what you're doing." But then one, you know, the Jeff Bezos of the bacteria. You can imagine all these internet companies form up with like these little bacteria and all this. But then the Jeff Bezos of the bacteria feels more power. He, he inherits, I don't know, he, he hits a big lump of nutrient juice in the water some, somehow, or a big like piece of chemical, maybe a big lump of zinc just hits on top of him, and he gets this burst of testosterone, and, and he maybe gets a little bit more sunlight than everyone else, and he's like, oh, I feel the power, and so he doesn't see what's going on, but he feels this, this desire, he feels this expansion of power, he feels more energy getting driven towards him, and so he expands and he grows, and, and he, he, he feels like he needs more expansion, more growth, more energy, so he, he reaches over to his next door neighbour, and he does the unthinkable, he, he reads Zarathustra, and he reaches over to the bacteria beside him, and he eats him. He grabs him in and he, he consumes his energy like this insane person. Blah, 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 blah. And now he feels he grows twice in size. He becomes bigger. And then this is what you're seeing now. Like you go on to any internet company on the internet and it's like owned by Amazon. Owned by, and Jeff Bezos is shooting up into space where everyone else is just trying to pay their bills. Jeff Bezos is like, yes, I can feel the power. I feel the power. It's expanding. And so he trusts this instinct. He's not, this, this piece of bacteria is not being like, oh, uh, well, it's wrong to uh, eat my fellow bacteria and all this. He's just like, no, eat the bacteria. <laughs> eat everything. <laughs> consume, consume, consume. And so he eats it all and then he swells into this monster bacteria, this super bacteria, this, this uber bacteria. And then he's like a huge being now with complex organs. He's like a fish, perhaps, or something like this. And he's he's he feels powerful and proud. And he's like well advanced over all these other bacteria. And now he just eats them for lunch every day. And it's easy, you know. They have no defense. They're just screaming like, don't hurt me. But he's like, nom, 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 I don't care. <laughs> Shut up. <laughs> Shut up, I don't care. I'm too powerful. I don't care anymore. And so he's in this great position of winning. And of course, this life energy that is going through the bacteria, going through him, what happens is when he reaches this, he feels this power, he feels this expansion, he feels this, he feels indomitably strong, he feels like no one can challenge him. So what, what starts to happen? He's like the lion who has conquered all the other lions, and now he's, all he's got is the lionesses around him. He says to himself, right, let's, uh, let's go make, let's go reproduce. So life says to him, it's not conscious, but life says to him, the energy inside of him says, you are working. Whatever you just did there is taking us a step forward 
it, towards expanding and getting out of this 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 game that God has set for us. So the energy says, "Oh, good, good move, right?" And it's felt again. It's not conscious. It's felt. And so this this Jeff Bezos bacteria, it starts to reproduce. It starts to reproduce versions of itself. It starts to impose copies all around the world, and and that feels good, and it is good, and there's no bad conscience about this at all. It's like, yes, this is good, and this of course keeps rolling on through life, and and this energy, this will to be the the more the more savage predator like thing. This game that's going on eventually ascends to to fish, and then these fish compete, and then you get like sharks, and then from the sharks, maybe a certain fish says, "Oh my god, these sharks are awful." So you have this little fish that doesn't turn into a predator, and he says, "Fuck, I'm gonna have to, I'm gonna have to get out of here." So he runs on land, and of course, land there's more space here, and so he goes with that. He, he's just going with his feelings. He's like, "All right, I'm safe here. This is okay." And then that evolves into like the first land animals. And then, of course, that turns into, you know, glorious beings like lions and dinosaurs or whatever. And eventually we pop up, you know. And so we're, a, we're an effort by energy to succeed in a certain way. There's these lions out there to go for the old school predator route. But we go for a more sophisticated thinking route and all this. And we're, we're trapped. We're these little monkeys. We're all trapped in our little huddles, our little tribes. We, we bind together, whereas the lions are kind of proud and evil in some sense. We bind together. And we're working together, but we're still tyrannized with these lions. We're not as strong as them. We're still not smart enough to quite get over it. But um, we're, we're getting driven by this energy. It's like advance, evolve, make your way through the game. All right. So you need to up a level. And most people are like, all right, look, um, what was it? like most people are sort of like, OK, cool. Like just just hide in the trees when the lion come. And then one, 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 one crazy chimp, one crazy boyo says, why don't we go down and fight the lions? And they're like, no, don't do that. Are you serious? Then they'll know where we are. Don't, don't do that. Oh my God, don't do that. But then one of them goes down and he, he, he goes and he, he figures out that you can pick up a bone and you can attach it to a, a, to a, a, a stone and create something sharp. And so he goes down and he fights the lion. He, he's, he's, there's this instinct in him that is telling him expand, even though most of them are just trying to clutch on and that's okay, but that's just not good. That's like with the little bacteria. He decides to expand. He, he climbs down and he, he strikes the lion down. The lion falls over and dies. And then he's, he holds up the lion's chest, the, the lion's heart, and he looks at all the rest of them and he eats the lion's heart and they're like oh my god he is the lion and he puts the lion's head on his shoulders or puts it on over his own head and he walks around with the lion's scalp and he's like yes i am supreme i have conquered the lion i i have absorbed the lion's energy i've absorbed the lion's power i am supreme and of course this guy becomes famous all around and whatnot but he's he's he's, he's like jeff bezos he doesn't stop and then suddenly he, he gets along all his tribe and all his tribe bow to him. He's now the lion man. And he says, now that I am the lion, I must go and take the other tribes. I must eat the other tribes. And they're like, what? Oh my God, you're crazy. And he's like, silence, I am the lion man. <laughs> you must do what I say. And so this energy that, that got him to conquer the lion is, is continuing to get him to conquer. But now he's going to conquer his fellow chimps. And so he runs to those next door neighbors down the road, you know, the guys in the, in the other village. And he, he, he runs in and he kills their, their, their alpha male. He kills their leader. And then he, he imposes his image on them. He, he, sees, he sees all the, the, the women girls, the, the women girls. <laughs> and he, he procreates with them and creates more versions of himself. Because life demands him. He says, you're succeeding. Create yourself more. More and more of you. You're good. Good. And there's all this good feeling. It's like, it's like power. Yes. Expansion. Make more versions of myself. And so this is, there's the story of history. Yeah, I'm sure. Yeah, social contract. Nah, bro. <laughs> like it was like this. I'm sorry. <laughs> and and so what, what's going on here? What, what's going on with this instinct is it's, it's not thinking about what's happening. It's feeling its way through. And it's not looking. And this is the great mistake we make. It's not looking for the nice thing to do. It's not looking for the safe thing to do. The instinct that leads us is looking for the dangerous thing that's going to bring us more expansion and going to allow us to create more versions of itself. Why? Well, because life is trapped. You know, God sort of threw us in the water like when you get a little baby and you want it to learn to swim you just throw it into the water and, and make sure and allow its instincts to kick in and you don't help it so we've been thrown in and we're trying to feel our way through the game we're trying to experience our way through the game we're trying to crawl with our hands away through the, the game and it's felt we don't have any eyes really 
You know, we don't we don't understand. We're trusting instincts. We're trusting the desire for expansion. We're trusting the desire to win. We're trusting victory, riches, and all these type of things. The rewards of success, the rewards of sexual power when you get loads and loads of girls after you kill the other alpha male and whatnot, after a lion chimp kills the other chimp. And and this is the generative upwards thrusting power of evolution. This is what actually makes us grow, is this desire, this lust for life, this lust for victory. And this is scary because this is a hard way to look at reality, but you it, it, it's dishonest to look at reality and deny that this is the animating force. These chimps didn't have some type of abstracted conscious left brain that was telling them what to do. It was actually much more about the fact that they were driven by these instincts, the same way as animals are. And you were not anything more than an animal. You're extremely driven by these still. We've learned quite a lot from people like Freud and Jung that these, these instincts drive your mind and your left brain does nothing but rationalize along with it, you know? And so what's what's going on when the something like a statue appears is very very similar to when something like a baby appears when when this this super bacteria this amazon this jeff bezos bacteria this lion chimp this um this this uber boy or whatever you want to call it when it <laughs> it overtakes every everything else and consumes its souls it um it, it starts to reproduce versions of itself because life says you're working you're good keep doing it more of you generate more of you and that's what the instinct says and so that's what reproduction is you know reproduce copy yourself make more versions of yourself and this is what drives the, the world forward it's like oh you're winning keep keep on making versions of yourself keep reproducing and it feels great and so what you start to see is that life almost as a signal of success starts to seek s images of itself because remember it, it like before you know, before you were conscious, you ever see a bird looking in, in the window at itself and it starts poking, it starts fighting itself because it doesn't understand what it looks like. But there's something instinctive in it where if, if it gives birth to children, it will recognize those children as its own and it will love them and be appreciated of them and take care of them. It's, it's serving itself in a very, very noble and beautiful way. It's not wrong. It's, it's, it's noble and beautiful. It's life realizing that this is precious and this is work and this is good. So keep, keep taking care of it. It's designed to fight for that stuff. And whoever fights for, you know, its children are hard enough, hard enough wins. And so what you see is that life is life is in this struggle. It's it's actually in this existential chaos where it's like, oh my god, what's going on? There's this oblivion creeping up to the, up to with this time limit where the energy is going to be taken from you. You're going to be stamped out and you're going to be gone. And in that meantime, you have one goal, and that is to expand. At the very least, thrive. At the very least, sorry, survive. And if you can expand, if you can grow, but life is like shuddering all the time. How do I do that? How do I do that? And so all these negative emotions get programmed into it. Fear, anxiety, desperation, frustration. You know that when someone's, you know, coming up and they, they want to win and they're trying to fight and they're trying to get up the, the hierarchy and all that. There's this incredibly intense young energy about it you know it's like i'm i'm here to i'm here to climb i'm here to get up top i'm here to win but then when the guy gets old and he has like a family and all this he relaxes he's after achieving the the basics and so he, he kind of loses his edge and all this um so it's, it's that type of energy what happens is the these negative emotions this, the energy programs these people with these negative emotions that actually drive them towards and um, participating competing trying to win but then finally when you know it, it reproduces it brings contentment it says to it it's okay you've made it you've done it you can relax now that type of thing and um, so you see this for example not just this is i know it's sort of male centered but I, I see this in women all the time my granny for example often brings me in and shows me pictures that she's collected where she's in seven generations so she's got pictures of seven different generations that she's been a part of. And this is probably the most meaningful thing she I've ever seen her show me. Like, she just loves showing me this. There's an immense amount of reverence. And because she's picking up and she's got, like, you know, her great-grandchildren, and then she's got a picture of herself with her great-grandfather or something like that. And you see her across, she looks at herself across these things, and she sees people like her, her people, you know, her image. She sees this in all these, these, these photos. And it's like her instincts are seeing in this, they're deriving this incredible amount of contentment for her because she's at the late age of her life and now she's understanding as she she might be her her spirit might be getting ready to leave it's like oh my god this is this is success i made it you know her consciousness is like oh it, it's done her animus her soul is like it's done it's been achieved it's been accomplished i've done it you know my destiny is set my destiny will continue my legacy will continue life is rejoicing through her is like i have achieved it and there's happiness there's a, a beauty to that you know
And this is driven by this idea of it, it, once it sees itself, it, it's happy. And so you start to understand what the purpose of a lot of art, a lot of this celebratory art, this prideful art is. You know, it's like this, when this instinct wins, when this, this, this lion chimp conquers all the other tribes in the area and becomes like the Jeff Bezos of the, of the, of the tribes, and it ascends to this position of super dominance, it turns around and it, it starts to produce out of itself um, feelings of, of create more children. And then what happens is that we humans are very, very sophisticated and complicated things. And so we have this ability to create more than just children. There, there's, there's a lot more to us. There's a lot more to us than this primitive ecstasy. There's actually this ability to, to produce forms, versions of ourselves. You know, the lion might, the lion man, the lion man might produce a, a statue of the lion. He might produce a statue of him conquering the lion as this vital energy reminding himself of that moment when he felt that power, that bravery, that courage, that emotion when that life energy in him erupted as an emotion of bravery and made him run down and fight the lion that was the moment when he he ascended into a higher level you know he he became expansive he became better and so when he creates that picture of that that ecstasy that craziness that and you know that's a big emotion to go fight a lion imagine how intense that would be how much fear you'd be feeling how much courage and and, and pride you'd be feeling after you conquer it imagine the ecstasy the, the dionysian ecstasy you'd have he creates a statue of that moment and it reminds him of that. And he demands all these people he have conquered create more statues like this. This is the image that they will see all around it. They will see me conquering the lion. And then all his sons will grow up and they will see that and they will feel that power. They're like, I, I have that in me. That's, that's in me as well. And they'll go do stuff and then they'll recreate statues and moments of this. And, and so the, the artist, in some sense, the, the creator, in some sense, is, is actually looking into his body, looking into his soul, if you will, and finding these profound energies and trying to produce them as symbols, as, as pictures. His, 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 um, or statues or whatever. He's trying to reproduce them perhaps as music or something like that. It's all this attempt to get what is inside him, what is felt, what is the ecstasy that is felt and, and put it into put it into reality pull it out of the 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 abstract uh, non-existent and um, chaos of your feelings and your your felt psyche and all this and actually manifest it as stone that ultimate flex of like i my my life my being was was my energy was struggling against this time this game that was going to destroy it but i've made it i've i've escaped not only uh, something like ephemeral ephemeral like time something ephemeral like consciousness something ephemeral like my soul and i've made myself as stone and i've achieved victory and i will last inside your mind for three thousand four thousand years or something like that that's an incredible incredible victory over the challenge of of death that's an incredible statement of power that's an incredible reward life feels and contentment life feels when it's like i have made it if i if someone if someone makes a naked statue of me that lasts for four thousand years i've, I've definitely made it on some level I've, I've definitely instagram flexed at a pretty high level that type of thing and so the the anchor towards all this generative energy the artistic energy is in this idea of this fundamental felt experience the animating experience your feelings this is where Nietzsche would get the thesis of Dionysus it's these feelings that are actually creating any, everything this rational Apollyan consciousness is not useful to you it's not it's not what you think it is it's not it's not the thing that's driving anything actually the 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 crux the place where this comes from the great artists they reproduce images of great feelings and these great feelings are experienced by great people because you are nothing more than a vessel for this energy and the thing that you're actually focusing on is less so than those disempowering moments where you don't have much energy where you feel impotent but in, in fact you're focusing on those moments when these these this this energy presents itself to you in the form of an empowering strong energy and it doesn't come to you all the time. Like you're not sitting around the couch feeling the, 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 the massive adrenaline kick of fighting a lion. That only happens in rare occasions. But that's the only part of you worth studying in some sense. Your, you know, rational consciousness is not really that important. It's this moment of this big emotion that matters. This is the, the crux of what life is. This is what drives life forward. And so 
all these various ecstasies get studied by get felt by the artist and studied by the artist the ecstasy of the feast the ecstasy of the the, the gladiator in the arena these are all profound different feelings that you can produce as you know symbols of the, you know the king the, the gluttonous king or maybe the, the 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 brave warrior or something like that and, and and bring it up and represent it as art and this starts to this starts to form what we could call the the feelings the these emotions these energies seeing itself in the world and it, it becomes this really it's almost like a magic spell when you put the image of the lion getting killed by the lion king what you start to see is the the feeling of bravery and when you study when you focus on that statue you it evokes that animus out of you it evokes that energy out of you and this becomes the the feedback loop and this is why cultures would build these pr powerful proud feelings around it it enlivens it it gives it energy these type of things and so um And so this entire thesis hinges on a deep trust for these energies and instincts. Your belief that that fury that's boiling up inside of you is good and that you should let it out and that your ability to create the space where you let it out is the most highest achievement that you could have. And when man was just bursting out of the jungle, he had a very clean conscience about doing that. He didn't really overthink the idea that he might be hurting other people and that he might be taking over the tribe. He might be taking over other tribes and, and like Amazon consuming them into his own will so he can re reproduce his own form. It's the same way as that we have a very clean conscience about the way we eat animals. We don't overthink it. We don't actually dig down into the realities that, well, you know, in order for me to survive as an, a, a meat eater, I must, um, I must absolutely destroy so many animal souls throughout my life. And I do it in a very horrendous, sterile, medicalized way. You know, I stick them into a factory and then they get, they get put into a line. They've got this like weirdly coldly de designed um, um, funnel where they don't freak out and then they walk up into this little box and then the box closes, the machine closes on them and then this bolt comes out and just stabs them in the, f the, the forehead and gone that's the end of them and it's it's very interesting that that's that's a you know all our talk about morality that is something that is so necessary for our health which is meat that we we don't we, we we avoid overthinking that we'll say stuff like you know i believe in uh, christian principles or ethics or everybody is equal or everybody you know the, uh, consciousness is it's wrong to hurt someone's consciousness it's wrong to hurt someone's feelings basically and then um, you know that that extends to humanity but then there's a hard line drawn on the boundary between man and animal and you know this is this is a very interesting thing to dive into it's like well why is that why is that drawn there and it's like well just because i said so just because you know my my ethical worldview my framework says so and you're like well is there a difference between an animal's consciousness and a human's consciousness and you're like well yeah obviously like the difference is uh, uh, uh they're the, the 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 being that you are and you're like okay cool okay interesting interesting but then of course this more ancient perspective this more roman perspective it was known as um actually it was known as animism the, the more pagan perspective, if you will, it was known as animism, is the idea that everything is alive. And there was a clear conscience about the idea that though animals are alive, I am, yes, feasting on their souls. I am eating their energy to serve myself. And there was a clear conscience about that. It's like, yes, I am doing this bad thing, but it's not bad in my mind. It's necessary. They're a lower form getting eaten by me, a higher form. And um, this is a very intense idea, but it is a foundational idea for understanding Nietzsche. And it actually goes against the transition between these two ways of seeing things. One is seeing consciousness as ascendant, and the other is seeing this animated energy as the source of generative power. Now, this is something that becomes even more interesting the more you dig into this, because Nietzsche then asserts again and again that the idea of beauty and success and winning and glory and higher forms as much as we'd like to think of it in this sort of neurotic idea that it's like something sophisticated and civilized that we do we don't it, that's not, like civil civilized societies don't tend to do this over rational societies don't tend to do this and he looks at the greeks as the brilliant point of study 
okay? So he looks at the Greeks and realizes that, okay, when these people were, were retching themselves out of the, the nature and the jungle, they still had a clear conscience about being monstrous. And but, but for that reason, they could actually very, very easily produce these beautiful, gorgeous, naked statues. They could go around and they could, you know, paint pictures of themselves. Well, this is this is Michelangelo's David, so this is an Italian doing a, a Hebrew um, a character. But nonetheless, you, you follow my point is that they they were um they could happily be butt naked you know they could happily present their glorious emotions and idealized versions of themselves as these butt naked motherfuckers flexing like imagine trying to do that nowadays you know instagram you're getting that back a little bit but imagine if if someone you know imagine if <laughs> imagine if trump or like putin or something like that said all right like i'm gonna put up a load of butt naked statues of myself everybody would be like no no you're not i don't want to see that in my society you arrogant and they'd, they'd see it as this like you know this narcissism and this arrogance that actually be a patho- pathologization of that behavior to revere yourself as pathologized as arrogant prideful negative narcissistic think of the way that we in our minds we parody the the um you know north korean dictator or something like that we, we imagine that he's 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 an insecure little creep that wants everyone to like like him you know so they he forces them to worship him and with all these pictures all around his his their 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 their, their family dinner that they, they have to look at my cult of personality and then that's a very very interesting psychological standpoint whereas over in the west you know a lot of the people from like places like north korea or people like in russia and all that or or people from you know non-western countries they would look at us as incredibly superficial and narcissistic you know up on instagram looking at our own image in some sense and and like massive hypocrites you know because we're like oh uh, you can't revere a great leader no that's that's disgusting you must revere me because i matter the most because I am, um, you know, I exist because I have consciousness. But that person, that that leader, he doesn't have consciousness. He's a insecure loser and all this type of stuff. And there's there's a lot of very very interesting problems with this way of seeing. There's a lot of bad conscience. And before that bad conscience entered into the world in the form of high civilization, we have a clear conscience that comes in the Greeks. And so their forms are very very natural, very very like the way an animal has no shame walking around naked. Neither did they. And so we still, as much as we like to counter-signal the psychology of this, we still revere this stuff. We don't revere the psychological realities that created this, this fiery, monstrous animal force inside of us that drives things. But we like the result. We like Greek statues, so much so that we, we, we adore them, even to a higher standard than most of our culture. But we don't adore this idea of um, it came from a monstrous energy of life. And we, we counter-signal that. Now, this is incredibly interesting for Nietzsche because he would say Socrates when Socrates showed up that was the signal that Greece was about to fall Socrates shows up and what happens is you have um you have Socrates showing up and that's the sign that people are starting to get rational and conscious and neurotic and Descartes like and stoic and that's the signal that Greece is about to fall and of course they do get conquered by Alexander the Great even though you think of him as a Greek he wasn't and they do get conquered by him pretty soon afterwards Aristotle was um, Alexander's tutor you know aristotle was robbed by alexander's dad to tutor alexander and this was the fall of greek culture the end of greek culture you didn't see these profound forms rising up anymore all of the reverence of the gods all of the 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 great war to create the space to give artists the time to produce the emotions as stories to produce the 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 those those stories as figures that had all been achieved before this that was all back when people had a very very strong clean conscience and so the 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 way that Nietzsche points to this is that the idea of how you do how do you make stuff that how do you recognize what is beautiful and he signals that it has to be tied to this life instinct it can't be it can't be divided it can't be separated from this life instinct and anybody who wants to try it is is what we could call the 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 descending of this stoic stiff this sorry this stiff uh, sterile over rational consciousness of you know Socrates or or overthinking the overthinker you can imagine it like the as I said before you have the neurotic artist who's got writer's block trying to be a perfectionist overthinking looking at all these like Greeks and being like I want to be like them but there's no instinct in him it's the instinct is not powerful enough to overpower his mind he's not in touch with it enough to get into to feel it and so he's um he's he's going against this in some sense he distrusts his own instincts now um the 
thesis that Nietzsche rolls with then is that the idea of beauty comes from this instinct. This instinct creates beauty. That's a very, very interesting idea. Nothing is beautiful. Man alone is beautiful. All aesthetic rests on this piece of ingeniousness. It is the first axiom of this science. And now let us straight away add the second to it. Nothing is ugly save the degenerate man. Within these two first principles, the realm of aesthetics judgment is confined. From the physiological standpoint, everything ugly weakens and depresses man. It reminds him of decay, danger, impotence. He literally loses strength in its presence. The effect of ugliness may be gauged by the dynameter. Whenever man's spirit are downcast, it is a sign that he scents the proximity of something ugly. His feelings of power, his will to power, his courage, his pride, these things collapse at the sight of what is ugly and rise at the sight of what is beautiful. So think about what's going on here. As I'm saying, he's trying to recognize in himself, man, the ancient Greek, he's trying to see, he's trying to empower himself. He has achieved this creation of space. He puts up these beautiful statues so he can see Hercules and remind himself and feel, you know, inspired. It's like the way put up, people put up motivational quotes on Instagram and then they put up pictures of people flexing. And this is just the a way more sophisticated, natural, healthy and beautiful version of doing that. This is putting up these motivational quotes in the form of like, you know, Hercules cutting off the head of some type of tyrannical bear that was haunt, haunting the village. And people are like, yes, I feel it. Yes, I could be Hercules too. There's That spirit is in me. Alexander the Great, you feel it. You look at Alexander, you'll be like, I can do anything, you know. He he went from, you know, this irrelevant backwater northern Greek state to, to the, the ruler of the entire earth. And you're like, I can fucking do anything. I can do it, man. That is unbelievable. That fills me with power. It gives me hope and all that. But then you see someone who's, you know, you, you see someone who's losing you see someone who's, who's got stuck in their head they're, they're impotent they're weak in energy and you think about a fighter you know like you follow a fighter and he he starts to lose and then suddenly people start to drift away from him in some sense they're sort of like he, he's, he's drawing a, a fall in energy he starts to feel sorry for himself he starts to complain you know the negative energy of complaining and, and people naturally distrust it they're like ugh I don't really trust I, I don't like this it, it doesn't give me the power whereas when you were winning I felt the power but I no longer feel the power and it's very very natural aversion to these type of things and so as we said these greeks he nietzsche was really trying to point out this idea of um the conscience coming in as a problem okay so so check this out to route up cases of beautiful souls golden means and other perfections among the greeks to admire say their calm grandeur their ideal attitude of mind their exalted simplicity from this i was preserved by the psychologist within me Instead, I saw their strongest instinct, the will to power. I saw them quivering with the fierce violence of this instinct. I saw all their institutions grow out of measures of security calculated to preserve each member of their society from the inner explosive material that lay in his neighbor's breast. This enormous internal tension thus discharged itself in terrible and reckless hostility outside the state. The various states mutually tore each other to bits in order that each individual could remain at peace with itself. It was then necessary to be strong, for danger lay close at hand. It lurked in ambush everywhere. The superb subtleness of their bodies, the daring realism and immor immortality, which is peculiar to the Hellenes, was, nece was a necessity, not an inherent quality. It was a result. It had not been there from the beginning. Even their festivals and their arts were but a means in producing a feeling of superiority and of showing it. They are measures of self-glorification in certain circumstances of making oneself terrible. The philosophers are, of course, the decadence of Hellas, the counter-movement directed against the old and noble taste. So Craig virtues were preached to the Greeks because the Greeks had lost virtue. Irritable, cowardly, unsteady, and all turned to play actors. They had more than sufficient reason to submit to having morality preached to them. No, not that it helped them in any way, but great words and attitudes are so becoming to decadence. <laughs> So this is this is just brilliant. This is this triggered me when I read it first as well. But um, I I really like you know the logos of music and the beautiful ideas and all this type of stuff. And uh, I I do I do like I I give you a critique of Nietzsche maybe later. But um, 
he punches on this and he says that you know the 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 again the consciousness and this is a really foundational thing to understand this is freudian and jungian this is a freudian thesis the idea that your libido is unconsciously driving your life and your consciousness is chattering away rationalizing what is happening to it but it's completely wrong it doesn't know what's going on it thinks it knows what's going on but it's it's just making up stories explaining what's going on you cheat on your wife and you'll explain to yourself oh it was an anima projection and all this type of stuff but it's like no bro you were you were just you just wanted to do what nature wants which is procreate as much as humanly possible with as many women as possible that's what Genghis Khan did when he had the power you just simply don't have the power so you have a bad conscience about it you know so you're just sort of being like oh well you know uh, uh, I'm, so, oh, I'm sorry this type of thing and um, there was any here's the excuse here's the rationalization if we learn anything about the left brain and the right brain is that the left brain fundamentally cannot see reality and has a propensity towards f- making up fake stories that explain to it what's going on it's known as cognitive dissonance well studied well founded and so the libido drives your behavior and your cognitive dissonance explains to you what is happening as an afterthought Nietzsche was on the money with this he talked about this often and we center consciousness and reason think of it rational thinking we center that as the highest virtue of all and what what you need to do in order to be a good people a strong people a creative people what you need to do in order to create the beautiful statues and all that stuff is you need to you know get program yourself with the right rational ideas but this is of course a disaster a mistake a complete idiotic um, approach towards things because that's never the generative source it's placing the the creative power in the wrong place you know and what does he mean by that well of course the the creative power he noticed in the greeks was the fact that they were fighting each other compet competition the sharpness you need in your soul in your heart in order to be strong to have strong instincts it usually comes from being at war and um, Heraclitus says war is the birth of all things. Now, this is not necessarily like, you know, bludgeoning each other with like nuclear bombs until you die. That's kind of stupid. But there is a sort of healthy competitiveness to the way that the Greeks carried themselves. They were always with clear conscience trying to be better than their next door neighbors. Like you talk about race troubles currently, but like these, the Greeks all looked pretty much the same, but they hated each other if they lived like down the road from them, you know? Like it was like, <laughs> never mind foreigners, like they just hated the guy from, the, they hated the guy from like the next town over that type of thing and then when they go do institutions like the olympics you know the olympics was about them flexing over their friends they'd literally stop war and they'd all go and they'd all like be like yeah i'm the i'm the strongest i'm better i'm better i'm superior to you i'm superior to you and i'm gonna take all your girls and i'm gonna take all the status and i'm gonna take all the wealth and all the happiness and all the rever- reverence and people are gonna remember me and you're gonna be beat down into non-existence and oblivion and i don't hate you for it but that's what i'm gonna do to you because i am life and life tells me to do it and all this envy and all this anger these mo- emotions that you 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 avoid because you're weak because you can't control them i trust them that I, I i do i envy you i do envy you i am angry at you i want to be better than you i don't want you to be better than me i'm gonna beat you i'm gonna fight you and i want to take you down and that, that's a horrible, like people would hear that nowadays and be like, what a psychopath, what's going on? But again, you're not, your instincts are not above this. You're not, you're, just because you're a conscious, you know, liberal Westerner doesn't mean that you're above this. When Conor McGregor rose up, he was literally doing this to Jose Aldo. He was being a dickhead, you know, but everybody was like, yeah, I love it. I feel it. It's so cool. Oh, it's awesome and all this type of stuff. But it was a very, very raw and and well felt experience. And, you know, the Irish kind of get an excuse because we were so, we were always seen as these like drunk, savage fighters and all this type of stuff. And so they're allowed to be like this. But but if you saw perhaps a Briton or, or an American acting like that, you'd be like, oh, Jesus. You know, these you'd have distaste for it for some reason. People people don't allow these people who rule the world to 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 be clear conscience aggressive and all this type of stuff. And so there's this um there's this thing with Connor where it it kind of flickered through that ra- that rancid aggressive competitive nature came through and and Nietzsche's saying that because that existed that actually made them healthy it, it forced them to constantly have a good relationship with their instincts and it was you know them coming out of nature them being an incredibly healthy people and um, doing this fight but of course that all left and then Socrates shows up and he starts to preach virtue but of course isn't and again this is really important to understand isn't virtue not rooted in 
concept. It's actually rooted in this. Virtue is founded on being brave. This is the Roman understanding of virtue. You have animus, which is your soul, and then their their conception of how you become a man, a veer, was based on the idea of you need to be virtuous in face of the truth. And so basically the idea is that there's reality out there and that you need to Find in yourself the animus to go and face reality with courage instead of cowering away from it with fear. And if you have enough animus, you will do that. And then you will experience the excellence of victory from facing veritas. Fortune favors the brave, another Roman phrase. And of course, that idea is where you get virtue from. Virtue is the having enough energy to face reality. That's literally what it is. But of course, what happens is that you change virtue when you get stiff old stoic when these great monsters craft this space for you conquer all the big bears that live around you and then give you space you, you start to get you start to float up you lose touch with these instincts everything society becomes more complicated it's less about competing because then you'd never get anything done it becomes more about cooperating your emotions domesticize they they get more about like putting aside your anger putting aside your aggression and then eventually everybody becomes less potent competition becomes frowned upon you get this sort of sneery attitude towards it and then what happens is virtue becomes something that you preach rationally after the fact and that's actually when your your culture falls and so that's the point where it's the twilight of the idols think exactly what Nietzsche is trying to describe think of what Nietzsche was trying to do he's trying to signal to us that this is coming dude our culture is done because we've lost our instincts and look what's happening now you know so let's um let's talk about this stuff a little bit more from the context of two people presenting this and so as i spoke about a lot of this stuff obviously like a lot of this stuff is eurocentric because i am a boyo and i am from ireland and i'm from europe and so this is the stuff that i understand it's my culture but i am a big fan of hip-hop i you know as i said i rap and whatnot and i've always listened to it a lot and i think a lot of these philosophical themes actually apply really really well to hip-hop and it's funny because hip-hop's so new you don't get really like many takes on it like maybe you could say the philosophy of hip-hop and you most especially don't get the sort of trad western perspective on philosophy and then uh, kind of applying it to what's going on with hip-hop but I, I seek to innovate today I seek to innovate and as I said move beyond black versus white thinking move on to this nuance move on to all this understanding of the way things actually work and of course you don't want to go to the kind of crappy version of hip-hop and and the, the, the mainstream stuff you know because it, it is at a, a sort of mature stage now it's, it's one in some sense but you want to go to the original you know you want to go to the early stuff you know you wouldn't go to Socrates and ask him what it means to be Greek you'd go to Achilles and watch Achilles be a crazy man you'd read homer and that type of thing and so krs1 is a very very early proponent of hip-hop and, and hip-hop was you know something that grew up in the in the slums and the ghetto so it was a, a, a energy as i said before these people were trapped in poverty and all they had were their instincts and their their thirst to be successful and then think of all these parallels between what i'm trying to say hip-hop kind of arose out of that culture where two guys would stand they have no instruments one guy would beatbox and then another dude would start rapping. And what he'd start doing is he'd rap and insult one of his friends. And then the other guy, did you ever see 8 Mile? And that's my access point into it anyway. The other guy, one of his, his mates or maybe someone he doesn't like, would walk up and rap back at him and insult him back. And it would become like a competition thing. And it becomes this incredibly fertile thing. So this is where you get this sort of flex in hip-hop. One thing that was so interesting about it is it's, it was it was um, different to where rock had sort of reached its, its decadent maturity and, and you know, the themes were start, sort of starting to turn like extremely religious and whatnot. Instead, what you had was uh, hip hop coming in and, and you have these guys basically being like I'm a winner you're a fucking loser I'm a winner you're think of Biggie Smalls basically being like I am rich I'm uh, I'm a king all my stuff I got off you you're a loser I probably killed you I probably killed you kill, killed uh, all your friends I killed your little crew your crew was weak you'd hear all this type of stuff and it was flexing it was competition you know it was like I'm the one getting out of the ghetto you're the one sinking down and becoming a broke fuck I don't care I'm a winner I'm better than you that type of thing my image gets imposed upon that and so it came from these vicious um, aggressive roots it became from a very similar kind of fertile ground that the Greeks were coming from and it's turned into a profound and very very interesting and creative culture and so let's listen to look at the, look for the themes that are so similar to this Dionysian energy that we see in KRS-One here check this out first of all hip-hop is not just a culture it's a new civilization 
okay. like straight off the straight off the bat. So everything we're talking about there, everything we're talking about this new this energy, this new energy that is it's creative in its ability to to rebaptize the world, to change the world, to create something new. It's not just a, a commentary. It's not just a you know. It's not an offshoot or it's not a, a a take. You know, it's not a hot take on on the nature of uh on the nature of, of of European or American civilization. It's it's new. It's vibrant and it's new. It's a new civilization, as he said. And this is such an interesting and, and well capitulated idea. Trump is one of the oldest cultures on earth. It is the first thing that human beings do when they come into existence. Yes. Breaking, emceeing, graffiti art, DJing. Breaking is dance. The earliest form of human communication anywhere is dance. How you move. Move according to nature, move according to the fish, the lions, the gazelles, the trees. This is what hominin humans did. Yes. This is early human, Neanderthals, uh, Rhodesia man, uh, Australopithecus, uh, early hominin human. The reason most sociologists don't regard hip hop as a culture is because they don't respect you. Okay. So again, this is this is so so interesting. Like I don't know, have you ever heard Ben Shapiro? Ben Shapiro turns around and be like, "Hip hop is not real music. It's um, just simply not okay. Like uh, I just don't treat it as real music. I never will. It's not important." And uh, <laughs> and uh, it's um, it's so funny because what what I'm sort of getting at is that idea of you know the rational mind um rationalizing against the instincts and and there's this there is this bit of anxiety from the European people where it's like you know hip-hop's dominating culture and it's like well we've got to have culture so there's this sort of you know disrespect for the newcomer it's like oh what's these you know these grugs banging banging drums and like rapping over it and all this there's that sort of energy to it and it's 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 kind of pathetic because this is is this where the energy is at? This is where the Dionysian feeling is at. And I know a lot of people don't like it. People want to be like, oh, make classical music again and all that type of stuff. But it's like, look, bro, you know, Wagner made classical music because he felt profound emotions that were connected to the European spirit. And like, you're just not going to see stuff quite like that in the same way until you get back in touch with that Euro European spirit. And when you're rationalizing against the European spirit, the same way as you rationalize against hip hop, well, you're, you're, you're boxing yourself into a losing position. You're being Socrates when you need to be Achilles, you know? And so think about the words that KRS-One is using here. KRS-One is turning around and saying, hey, bro, like hip hop is felt, it's movement, it's life, it's energy. You see, he's saying like the fish, like nature. How is that any different than what we're trying to talk about with this Dionysian idea? God makes the, the world, he plugs the energy into it and then everything starts to move. And then these guys, they feel these movements and they start to let it out. And it's not just a musical thing. That's a huge mistake to make. It's, it's fundamental to their spirit. It's the African spirit releasing its understanding of reality. You know, it's projecting its energy out into the world. And so they move, their muscles twitch, all this stuff kind of goes off. The, the fireworks go off, the, the, the dopamine is flowing and all this. You see it in the fish and it comes out as dance. It comes out as beats. It comes out as a way of talking, their accent. It comes out as like the way they dress, the way they move, the way they treat people and all that. It's because the foundational Dionysian energy is the root of that. And you, you're seeing here the burdening of a culture. You're literally witnessing it right now. It's an, And perhaps it's an extension of something eternal. But look at the way they understand it. Look at the way some of their best thinkers understand this stuff. Even think about the the sort of um, the 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 unashamed um, look. The, the Nietzsche called it the naivety of the Greeks, and this this sort of unashamed statement of like my reality matters here from KRS One. Like think of if a white person you know was was sort of trying to defend their their just instinct to to be themselves and be their culture and be like you know I my da like dancing started and my version of of native dancing is like the extension of the original humans and all this type of stuff and and KRS One can just sort of be like yeah well like I I feel it and I believe it and kind of fuck fuck your academies but of course the the, the European person have to be like uh, well I don't know I'll, I'll I'll go I'll go on Google and I'll um, I'll check the I'll check the studies to, to back up that thesis. Um, okay, I'm on, on Google. Um, did uh, did did European people dance in the in the ancient times? Yeah, yeah. 
oh well uh, there's no there's no evidence for it so sorry emotion sorry Dionysus you're gonna have to fuck off because you know I can't trust you because you know the brain is not satisfied of these type of things and you could, you could literally diagnose that as neurosis you know and of course KRS-1 I'm sure I'm sure he has the same anxieties he has a mind like us he's like oh god I need to I need to verify it I need to prove that like so people take it serious I'm sure a part of him is, is, is nervous about that it's like I need to present this to, to people so that they take it serious but there's another part of him that's strong that's like I don't care. <laughs> I believe it. I feel it. I believe it. You know, it's obvious when you want to dance, you feel the dancing. So it's that type of thing. Because we call these uh, expressions of ours elements. These are the elements breaking, I'm seeing graffiti or DJing. These are elements. So whenever you write elements, at least the chemical society of the world writes their elements as penicillin, mucin, um, uh, it goes on and on with the way you spell the way you spell chemical elements. Now most people look at breaking them, seeing the graffiti art and DJs as oh, just some black kids dancing. That's their prejudice. If we just look at the facts, we call our expression elements. We spell them as elements, not slang language. M C N E M C E E I N G. So because we say M C N, we drop the G. Uh uh-uh. uh. We purposely leave the G off because the G doesn't exist. We're talking about elements. The elements are what we're talking about. Now let's come back. Breaking. First things human do, dance. Second things human do, utter. Beatboxing. Music with your body. That's ancient, ancient, ancient. Before, go to the great Buddha Mm -hmm. in Asia. So again, like it's it's the same motif. This energy in him, energy in his people, they form together around this energy. You know, they they all release this energy in an idealized form. It comes out as rap. It comes out as dance. They form together and they understand themselves as this energy pouring out of them. This is you know this is Dionysus appearing in them, and, and they they pull it out and they present, and we see it. And of course, we've neuroticized ourselves to the point where we can't connect with that in ourselves anymore, and so we feel jealous, we feel nervous, we try to steal it off them. You know, we try to we try to partake. We want to get in on the party because everyone wants to go where the energy is. At. That, that type of thing and we struggle with it philosophically because of the way that we understand ourselves and I want you to show a juxtaposition then so there's this unashamed happy healthy pride here you know like this dude is literally saying like yo hip hop was the, the, the thing that started at the beginning of the world and he's not necessarily wrong either like as I said you plug the universe in this vicious energy of life shoots out of people and projects itself into the world and of course it was there at the start and hip hop is a, a, a sort of development a purification of that energy in the, in the modern context but but there is that sort of unashamed in this and I want to show you now a and I want you to really watch what I'm trying to describe a a sort of a very famous person described the 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 try struggle to get over the problem with the European thing so this is Jordan Peterson the- after getting questioned about the idea of European pride, about the idea of um, you can believe in yourself as a European person, and look, I don't, I don't think he has bad intentions. I like, you know, I know why people are scared of this type of idea. It's like we're all turn into Nazis if we start like liking ourselves or something like that. But again, it's there's this, there is this subtle neurosis to this type of thing. There is this thing that we have to talk about a bit, which is this idea of of the the rational understanding that you can believe in yourself, that you can let that energy out, like that energy is healthy and it's good. You you see how well the Africans are doing because they have an unashamed relationship to that. And that's good and good for them. And they deserve to win. If they are able to do that spiritual conquest and find these great energies in themselves and release it and produce interesting and beautiful art that even we appreciate and I appreciate so much power fucking to them, you know. But at the same time, you don't want to have to listen to people like this. And Jordan's a genius. I love him. But he, he's 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 damaging your relationship with the most fundamental part of yourself. He's being so Socrates he's hurting your ability to believe in your emotions and he's not doing it with bad intentions but like you can see why he's doing it it's this struggle we all have especially in a civilized state where we 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 find it hard to understand our feelings and then we find Nietzsche and he's 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 telling us about this stuff but he's hurting our feelings and that makes us turn Nietzsche into our shadow and we get really really mad at him you know so uh, have a listen to this and just just look for these patterns Medieval Europeans identified seven deadly sins for a reason, and one of them was pride. It's like, let's make the presumption. I do believe that 
for, for reasons that aren't obvious that the West has got some things right we've got the sovereignty of the individual right that's the most fundamental thing we've got right we've articulated that I think in a, in a remarkable way not only theologically, philosophically in our body of laws in our societies and one of the consequences of that as it's had its effect on the rest of the world is that everyone is getting richer quite fast and that's a really good thing so this is this is sort of the example here it's it's like what is the west well it's a body of laws that makes everybody rich and you're kind of like <laughs> i don't know like listen to krs1 and the healthiness of the way he talks he says like hip-hop is a civilization feeling of being alive it's a feeling it's a movement of being alive you know and and you you there's there's this inability for 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 us to go to the idea that the west is 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 like like the repository of these cathedrals and statues and art and music and and way of being and manners and experiences and way of dancing there's how are we so incapable of understanding that these are all signals that we are alive and we believe in ourselves and we're healthy? These are all vital energies that we, of course, look back to now and we rationalize them and be like, oh, because we made those statues, well, it was because we had you know, the Magna Carta or something like that or the laws and all that. It's like, this is this is not what we are in that type of sense. And and I'm, again, I'm not trying to be hard on Jordan here. I'm just trying to point out a very, very subtle and important distinction. Okay, having said that, it's like, am I proud of that? It's like, I didn't do that. What the hell? Pride. What's that? That's not the right response. How about responsibility for that? How would that be? It's like, you're part of this, this great and unlikely set of propositions this strange set of propositions that says so so again you know do you see do you see what i'm trying to point out about the almost like socratic rational conscious like neurotic and i don't mean that as an offense i just want to point out what i'm seeing here the patterns the the kind of equalizing consciousness seeing something like the west as propositional no it's propositions you you are you created these propositions and that's what it is that's what holds the whole thing together it's computer code you know it's not something deep and it's not the heart that beats it's not that it's not your heartbeat you know you can't believe in that and, and then think about how these words how silly they would sound if you turn if i turned around and played that video of krs1 and i was like you shouldn't have pride in hip-hop how how arrogant of krs want to be proud in his hip-hop ridiculous you know and i actually see him as healthy i see him uh, or krs one is extremely healthy and i wish him well but i also understand that you need it in yourself as well it's a very very simple and obvious and rational position is that in some ineffable manner the poorest person is as valuable as the king it's like how the hell did we ever figure that out that's an impossible thing to think and yet that's the that's the bedrock of our legal system. That's nothing to be proud of. That's something to tremble before. To take on as a, an ethical burden. And not to wave a flag for how wonderful you are that you happen to have the same skin color as some of the people who thought that up. It's not the and it, it is very and it's a fair point like this is a fair point is that like just because you're white doesn't mean you're great it's true race is not necessarily an ideal like you can't just turn around and be like i i create cathedrals it's like no you don't bro no you don't so that's definitely true that's a good point but again there's this interesting thing you can look at from this nietzschean perspective where like even think of that word nietzsche said um that the greeks would quiver with will to power instinct towards greatness instinct towards producing energy releasing energy the same way as the you know the 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 Africans would like shudder when they're like they're all their muscles are twitching because they're feeling so much life in them and then it turns into this brilliant culture and then of course Jordan is, is is describing here this this awful problem that we have where the only way we can interact with these great things is that we, we don't have any will left inside of us to create a cathedral and so the only quivering and trembling is actually for us to like cr like fold over in this as we said in this fallen form and, and almost bow before these things and shiver like the way a priest has to prosthesize himself in front of the altar because we don't have the energy left inside of us to produce something divine and godly because we are well we, we are rationalizing against it maybe we've lost it who knows maybe we're at a falling part of our culture and so what happens is that our trembling our our the things that our movement our inner movement is gone it's 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 somewhere else now at that point it's it's now moved towards a, a different experience the right response it's like it's 
It's to open your eyes and recognize that as a miracle and a relatively, a relatively new miracle on the world stage and to, and to participate in the process of upholding that in your personal and your public life That's not pride in European tradition Like, when I go to Europe, and I love going to Europe, and the European cities are they're unbelievable masterpieces, which is why they're completely flooded by pilgrims, right? Tourists, pilgrims, who go there to look at the beauty It's like, I don't feel pride about that I feel, I feel like I have something to live up to That's not the same thing, man and, so and, and he's not necessarily wrong, you know, like he's, he, he's making good points here, but I'm trying to get you to see the sort of, maybe the generalized neurosis that's going on with us in general. And the reason why I point this out is because we, we do the very sad thing of like, we look to African culture, the, the ascendancy of hip hop, and we, we react to it because we can't, we don't, we don't have any originality left in us. We can't, we can't be the progenitor, progenitors of, of energy and of culture, and we can't make stuff in the same way anymore. And so we have to steal in some sense, as I said. We're like actors trying to act like them, not be ourselves. So these right wingers in this, it's like, look what we've done. It's like, and so there's there's sort of the problem. It's it's been politicized. Like you can see, the problem is it's it's the the intellectuals are afraid of it because it's a political thing to understand. So that's a very very dangerous thing. You've now politicized the European soul. You've you've attached politics and a very very unreliable definition which is left and right to the most fundamental thing of all which is the the spirit that lives within you the heart that beats within you you're telling me that your heart is right wing that's a very very interesting perspective you know um so yeah you're using your unearned the unearned gift that's been granted to you as a source of personal pride in your accomplishments due to your skin it's like no yeah and so th this is this is such an such an unbelievably interesting take like it, it it gets reduced to skin as i said like you're politicizing um so so if i was to accuse and i really don't want to pick a fight with jordan jordan's a chad but if i was to accuse him of anything here i would i would i would actually say superficiality you know like and this is the, this is not his fault this is an extremely complex problem and for example i think nietzsche holds many of the greatest answers but my god nietzsche is a hard dude to deal with because he's like as you're reading it he's basically like you're a bitch here's all the reasons why you're wrong so that's a kind of hard thing to read but but think about it it's it's like um and i understand he's saying to people like look I'm, I'm white so i'm i'm the guy who built the cathedral but that's a superficial understanding of what's going on here as we're trying to describe there's this heartbeat this and nothing's more fundamental than your heart and millions of millions of europeans all have this heart that was you know it has been extending back hundreds of thousands of years uh, with, with with us and us doing our thing and you know the greeks we look back at them because their heart was so strong there was so much vils to mox inside of them that they produced all that great stuff and obviously all the beautiful architecture that causes the pilgrims to come to Europe and the Renaissance and all that stuff and those statues and those paintings and all that like that came out of the deep energy in these people it's an energetic thing it's not it's nothing to do with skin it's not that type of thing it's nothing to do with this repository of abstractions these are all the incorrect things we need to understand it was all deep inside of us these deep heartbeats these deep feelings all this type of stuff that's a different experience a much much different experience a much more tender a much more sincere and much more vivid and not really the superficial thing it's not political it's not skin color like it's that's not what it is at all the fact and have you ever seen an italian before they're swarthy you know and there's us irish like we're you know we're one of the most conquered races in all of europe but we're probably the whitest we're probably the people with the whitest skin so like color is just a silly thing the scandies are literally like golden people they look yellow sometimes and that's 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 a very very complicated and different perspective that's showing that if, if we are going to accuse people of misplaced pride based on their skin it's, it's kind of pointing to our restriction on this problem you know not good not a good argument not good so and that doesn't mean that well there's nothing valuable about european culture there's plenty there's plenty about it that's valuable it's not even so clear to what so again let's let's not i uh, know this is a very very interesting thing I agree so. it's european i mean it came out of the middle east you know i mean who so yeah so 
again, he, he he's trying to, as we said, make a very important suggestion. It's like you can't just sit around and be like, God over here, God over here. Have you seen? I, the, did you know that I'm I'm I, an Irish man? It's like yeah, I can claim I can claim Rome. Then I guess is that how it works? Is that it? like I built Rome and all this type of stuff? We was we was kings. Yeah, the Irish the Irish were the guys who built the pyramids and all this. Um. Yeah, sure. There's, there's, there's sort of a, a misplay. I'm trying to get you to see. There's a misplacement of understanding of generative power. And um, Jordan is making a very, very common and and not not an innocent mistake where it's it's sort of suggesting that like it's this rational brain up here that creates culture. You know, the the, the source of culture is the abstractions, the abstracting mind, the propositional law, and all this type of stuff. The the and then and then what what the mistake that people make is of course that. They they think that you know, um, because I have the same skin color as the people who had this rational propositional Descartesian mind. That I I did it too, you know. Whereas the the suggestion, the counter thesis that Nietzsche is sort of presenting here, and he's not obviously going against Jordan, but it's a very important thing to understand is that this idea is that the the vivid explosive energy inside your belly inside your gut inside your heart the thing that makes you live the thing that makes you breed the thing that makes you move the thing that the africans got in touch with allow them to create such beautiful culture as hip-hop this is the source you know it's a spiritual problem this is the source and you're not you're not a bad person for getting this wrong definitely not but but you are incorrect and so why I'm showing you this is to show the difference between what Nietzsche would call a clear good conscience krs1 and a guilty conscience, a bad conscience, you know, a, a conscience that is struggles with itself. KRS one feels good energy inside of himself and wants to release it as culture, and therefore his culture has now achieved hegemony, and that's good for him. Well done, you're a winner. Love it. Now Jordan, his he, he doesn't feel the vitality, or maybe his culture doesn't feel the vitality it used to, and so he's stuck in this this neurotic intellectual place trying to understand what's going on. And again, he's not he's not like he's doing this on purpose in a bad way. It's just it's a consequence of 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 civilization, you know. And again, this is something important to paint. It's kind of a tragic thing to realize, but there's this sort of fall of Rome pattern. You have these monsters who follow this martial energy. They hold Mars, literally the god of war, as their messiah, and they put together. Rome as this giant like you know ritual of, of of their their libido gathering together and it's all focused on this type of stuff and Mars is what rules it and then they create so much wealth that all the Romans get arrogant and luxurious and taste you know they 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 they, they lose the virile energies that put it together and they get they get decadent as you'd say and then the collapse comes then what happens is they don't have the strength within them to hold it together and what happens then at that point is that you have these characters popping up that start to rationally explain virtue back to them the same thing happened to thinking clear conscience that i, I want to hold this together this is a brilliant thing rome was a brilliant thing i want to hold it together and they explained to them oh rome was about conceptualizing all these ideas in your mind these propositional ideas you know si the roman citizen the roman um, moors these type of things keep these in mind but of course it didn't ever come from your mind it came from the body and the mind only interpreted them as an after effect you know same with the Greeks, immense explosive power of the Greeks, and then as that's waning from from comfort and from um, civilization, domesticization, um, Socrates pops up and tries to to spatter virtue back to it. Now it's very timely that Jordan rose up in a uh, in a very very interesting time where people felt like the West was in a crisis, and he's like, oh, we have to keep the West together and all that. Good conscience, as I said, he's sorry, he's he's he's, he's not he's not doing it like in a, in a to be nasty or anything like that. He's he, he's just genuinely concerned about something he treasures a lot but um he's appearing as socrates you know he's appearing at the end he's appearing at the or you could say a a, a struggling moment at the very least a crisis moment at the very least and it, it's all sort of coming through now if you know what i mean it seems like the like the the way that the romans saw the christians like left-wing anarchists you see this all going on now as well and and you might say well what you got to do is tell all these people oh propositional ideas of the west and all that but that's that's not what's going on at all it's 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 about energy Energy. You know, it's about feeling, and and the, the people who made the West have, have lost their energy. You know, and they they don't have a contact with it. They have actually they've they've marred it with shame of all things. And so now we can talk about again. These are very very difficult problems. I'm trying to not to cast judgment and just point out that these things are tragic in the way that they manifest. And. Um, 
in order to participate in a society, you have to, in some sense, restrict your Martian, martial energy. You have to restrict Mars. You have to restrict your, your fiery energy. You have to restrict your pride. You have to tame it in some sense. And and what often happens is that you go too hard on that. It's like you get a, a, a horse and in your effort to tame it, you beat it into, you beat it to death, basically. You know, you, you're trying to beat the horse so that you can hop on top of it and ride it. That's ideally what you want. But because you're 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 afraid of it and you, you don't understand it and you're not good at what you do, you, you 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 kill it you know you kill the horse you make the horse evil and this is um this is just what domestic society does to you this is what sterile stale society does to you and it's all, always the signal of a sort of crisis point and and the the answer is actually to change the position w- what you're trying to fix jordan's trying to fix our mental stuff he's trying to fix our propositional ideas but what if he's looking at it from the wrong first principle what if the right first principle is actually understanding the soul is in this thing it's in the body it's in it's in it's felt it's experienced in here it's dionysian if you will it's not apollyan and proposition okay um and so to give you an example of of how this happens basically you know you have people like uh, the martian romans the martian romans coming from outer space but you know they're they're martial energy they're aggressive they're um they're trusting their virile instincts and they become very very generative and creative um now they're trusting their passions they would have what we call a an affirmative relationship with their passions all their passions would be seen as sophisticated and good and their problem is to stoically tame their passions it's the horse metaphor so what happens is they've got all this monstrous fire inside of them and they you you have a a gradient if you just let the stallion lead you you'll become you know weak and uncontrolled and chaotic but if you but if you completely kill the stallion off you'll have no virile energy and so what you need is you need to release those passions but tame them you need to hop on top of the horse you need to break the horse in as Nietzsche said the ubermensch the overman will be able to take the chaos of his passions and impose order upon them add style to his personality and unify them all as one will and this is what something like Rome achieves through their religion they you know this is why pantheons show up you have these variety of different passions like uh, Hermes or whatever or, or Mars and all this or Athena or whatever and then um, they all get they all get beat into shape by Zeus, by the conquering energy of Zeus, by the the logos, the supreme energy that puts them all together and directs them towards goals. And so, his critique of, of Christianity, but, the, but the, maybe don't get too caught up in Christianity. See it as the domestic domesticating forces as they start to appear. What happens is you create this powerful, big, greedy, comfortable, comfortable civilization, and then these characters pop up. And as we said, they need to help people live together in a community. And so what they need to start doing is actually putting down high testosterone behavior. You know these these martial energies. They they either send them to the army, and anything that's left in the in the domestic community needs to be beaten into shape. You know. You actually need to castrate the horse. Think of what you do to, like a lot of people do just to dogs. You know, they domesticate dogs by castrating them. It's pretty intense, but that's how things work. And so um, it's about cutting off energy. And it's, it's, it's a very blunt way of doing things. Nietzsche would critique that perhaps we're stuck in this cycle of powerful energies creating civilizations and then civilizations falling because essentially self-castration. How do, we, how do we launch into the future? How do we create a civilization that can overcome this pattern? You know, This is perhaps when you start again the really hardcore sides of Nietzsche. And he, he criticizes the church as describing this unsophisticated black and white way of seeing things. There's no new wants to the idea of what a passion might be the church combats passion by means of an excision of all kinds its practice its remedy is castration it never inquires how can a desire be spiritualized beautified deified the same means castration and ex- extirpation are instinctively chosen for waging war against a passion by those who are too weak of will too degenerate to impose some sort of moderation upon it by those natures who to speak in metaphor and without metaphor need la trap or some kind of ultimatum of war a gulf set between themselves and a passion only degenerates find radical methods indispensable weakness of will or more strictly speaking the inability not to react to a stimulus is in itself simply another form of degeneracy radical and mortal hostility to sensuality remains a suspicious symptom it justifies in being suspicious of the general state of one who goes to such extremes moreover that hostility and hatred reach their height only when such natures no longer possess enough strength of character to adopt the radical remedy to renounce their inner satan 
And so you can imagine, we've, I've talked about this before, the church come in and they have all these, like, they come into Europe and they have all these Germans running around being Vikings. And so they have to start baptizing the energy inside them as Satan. They have to say that's wrong. And they have to, to spiritually castrate them pretty much, in order to domesticate them and tame them. And look, that might be a good thing or a bad thing. It's hard to know. This is complex stuff. It's not about like, oh, out and outright following your passions is good. But it's also about understanding that there, there is a, a propensity towards castration of passion as well that loses your ability to create energy. Now, as we said before, this animating passion, these energies underneath you are the source of all great things that these people like Socrates and Jordan Peterson and all that, they look back towards and say, that was beautiful beautiful that was great but but they make the mistake of saying that came from the propositions and all that but no it came from the animus it came from the ener energy underneath and then um, you you see then what what is sort of the priestly type and this is actually what Nietzsche this is a hard critique against intellectuals as a archetype the priestly intellectual or the modern intellectual whatever you want to call it, they they tend to be weak of spirit themselves they don't have strong energy you know they've never really been brave they've been stuck inside the monastery or the academy or the the university whatever you want to call it and so they're sitting there in their their little sort of self like they're, they're you know they're sort of like the preservative characters like you see in um with the back bacteria you have jeff bezos rising up following this ambitious craziness but then you have these little conservative bacteria and you imagine if they were like writing down all their scripts they'd be like talking about oh jeff bezos's evil powers is gonna like make us all fall down and, and, get, and get eaten or something like that and i guess they're right in some sense but there's um there's this fear there's this instinct in them and this is actually the survival instinct starting to creep into their consciousness telling them they need to castrate jeff bezos because if they don't he will eat them so they're sort of correct in some sense but they go the the long way the rationalizing way around about that and then if you give these people the status as the rulers of your society as the high priests of your society they will spiritually castrate all your sons and that's not good that's that's not something you want to happen you're never going to generate the glory of ancient greece the glory of the renaissance which is the, the, the bursting back of ancient Greece. If you castrate spiritually all the people who are trying to do it, think about how this works, you know, like um, you had medieval Christianity and, and you didn't see many statues. There was even iconoclasm was a, a discussion. That is the, the removal of images, the removal of art from religious studies. And then what happens is finally the Italians integrate the, the, the Christian movement into the, the old pagan feelings that they felt. They produce this renaissance, this rebirth, this return of the instinct again and then what happens Nietzsche hated Martin Luther is Martin Luther goes and sees all this decadence and this greed and rightly so he's correct it is immoral by the standards of what Christianity would demand and so he runs out with his book and he tries to beat them all into shape he gives he gets angry at them he's like no 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 he, he gets the book and he tries to beat them down again he tries to return he tries to castrate them again you know and this becomes a very very complex complex and, and difficult problem because as I said it's about the the, the nuanced golden mean you've got the the magic horse which is when you're riding the horse you're riding the passions but you want to avoid castration you want to want to also avoid just simply giving into it but you can start to understand the symbol the symbology of what goes on what the priestly type does and i see this in jordan peterson and i see this in Jung as well and i also see it in um ancient christianity in the way that they entered europe like i'll give you some examples here you probably think of satan as having horns you know satan is this nasty dude with horns but actually originally satan was lucifer like this is the, where he originally appears as a symbol he's this 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 fallen angel he has this more mellow light to him in some sense a being of light in some sense and he's an adversary and a deceiver these type of characters but when the christians come into rome the priests come into rome they're sitting around and they see and um, that the the native pagans worship this character called serenus this was a celtic god and he was a god he was a deer he was supposed to represent fertility and the aggression of a young man you know he's he's this fertile character he's this he's basically testosterone personified and the horns you can think of the, the crude metaphor of horniness you can think of the horns as that fertility the, the stag with the big horns is the the healthiest stag of all that type of thing and so um they come in and they actually start to adopt this character as satan and this is where satan starts to get his horns this is what some people allege you see that they when they go into northern uh, northern scandinavia they do the same with um they do the same with odin 
and the the sort of goat worship I believe they did up the very very top they start to turn that into Satan so they Satanize these native figures these and as we said that the Romans followed Mars that that energy that martial energy and it carried them up to create Rome and of course the Christians come in and they have to demonize that in order to, and put Christ in its place when they come into Europe they do the same thing you know you have all these people who have this virile energy this undomesticated wild energy and again this is not about good or bad or judgment it's just a quite a neutral thing it's some somewhat relative and they come and they impose this critical symbol on these type of energies they put it down in some sense and look this is a domestication thing so it's not it's not it's not black and white it's it's a sophisticated problem perhaps they were right perhaps they were right to impose that and then they could they could discipline all of europe towards super goals the catholic church unified all of europe perhaps that was a good thing that was the new rome you know you see this with young like of course the nazis came up around about young's time so he started doing the same thing he started to 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 categorize that energy as woden and i I, i'm pretty sure jordan peterson picked up on this and so there's this terror of of the the european animus and that's that's like fair enough you know if you're scared of losing control of it this is what you start to do but of course there's a sophisticated nuance to this type of stuff you have to also understand that you're not necessarily you shouldn't be castrating it at the root which is what I believe Jordan is starting to lean towards. You should you should be more about taming it, you know? It's like hop on the horse, don't kill the horse. There's this fear, obviously, because it'll get out of hand. And yes, of course, you don't want it to get out of hand. That is weak as well. You want to have a strong will that can tame it. Nietzsche said the same thing. Nietzsche said, okay, the, the German people are too hot-headed and they need to control their temper and, and be disciplined or else a disaster is going to happen. And so Jung and, and all these, they're, they're getting on top of this. But then we have people grip onto these ideas and make them absolute, turn them into Satan, the absolute evil. But of course, this Satan you're creating is the source of your generative power. It's your soul, your animus. I even think there's some interesting psychoanalysis. You could call this a critique of Jung, where um, the animus, the Roman word animus, meant this fiery energy. Now what Jung does is take that Roman animus and turn it into this effeminate idea of the soul, this abstracted conscious idea of the soul, and then pathologizes the actual animus of, of, of energy a little bit. So maybe there's something going on there that he's sort of functioning as this high priest. Who knows? He steals the word animus, turns it into anima. It's one of his key concepts, you know? And then... Um, you can you can look into all this stuff and see these these very nuanced and complicated problems that are going on, but you you understand that these people are like you know Jung's not some evil genius and all this. The priests weren't necessarily evil geniuses. Neither was Jordan Peterson. They're trying to solve a problem, but the, the mistake and this is the, the 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 damning problem of psychology is that psychology forces you into this sort of intellectualized idea that I'm studying the mind, therefore I'm studying like concepts. I'm studying and it's all about like sorting out these concepts in my consciousness. But but Nietzsche is this genius psychologist because he precisely de-pedestalizes the mind and focuses on the body and the body is the the place where you wage the war you know this is incredibly important to understand and um, he, he criticizes these priestly types because these these people get the get the, the the authority to actually decide how your soul should be oriented they control you and and their authority is not granted without criticism and the priestly type does not mean priest it means the sort of generalized intellectual type that forms this sort of uh, improver of mankind he calls them the, the shaper of mankind the, the decider and again we're trying to point out that what what shapes glory and greatness and all this is usually this vital virile energy and then these characters usually slip in on top of that and start to rationalize what's happening and then they you know they're they become like the traditionalists that are trying to call back to a time that that's long gone and they, there's no generative power in that like what you're looking for if you want to save the west if you want to change the future and all that your 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 problem is that you need to actually be generating something new something lively you need to find life again you're never going back there is no going back it's it's gone you know like there's no you're not you're not going back to the Renee it's none of that stuff is happening you need to find the energy in yourself and, and re revitalize it again and tame it you can't just like go crazy and and and, and like let it go that would be stupid you need to find it in yourself have the strength of character to discipline it and so he Nietzsche gets mad at these people who you know impose their authority because of this silly you know moralizing he calls it and he says let us at last consider how exceedingly simple it is on our part to say man should be thus and thus this is someone who's turning around and saying man shouldn't be 
um, you know, crazy and, and martial and, 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 and full of animus and full of a monstr- monstrous energies. No, that's bad. Nietzsche, Nietzsche criticizes that. It's like, well, who are you to, con- to, to, to criticize nature? Who the hell do you think you are? And so reality shows us a marvelous wealth of types and a luxuri- luxuriant variety of forms and change. And yet the first wretch of a moral loafer that comes along and cries, no, man should be different. He even knows what man should be this sanctimonious prig. He draws his own face on the wall and declares, ecce homo. Now, this is such a good take because how, what, what, what goes on? What, what happens here, right? So Nietzsche is pointing out that these people, these priestly types, they come in and they, they are spiritually castrated themselves because again, they're, they're like conservative bacteria. They're afraid of Jeff Bezos. And so what they do is they sit in their academies and they write really, really long complex books about, about how being afraid of Jeff Bezos is actually noble. And then what they do is they 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 castrate courage because what would be brave is for them to go and compete with Jeff Bezos, but they avoid that. And so what they do is they 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 castrate themselves spiritually and and say those courageous feelings that Jeff Bezos felt in order to be ambitious are bad, and my feelings of being conservative and staying still are good. And then they go around they 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 you know they they strive into these positions up in the hierarchy, and then they start to reproduce their forms in the form of these books, these rationalizations, and then they start to explain to people is that what you should be is me now in a very indirect way they say i am eche homo i am the man i am how man should be you should be scared and castrated spiritually like me they start to replicate themselves the bacteria that are competing with jeff bezos want to replicate as well it's a very very savage world but this is how it works and so Nietzsche gets mad at these. It's like, why are we giving these people authority over our souls? They're not going to do anything good for us. They're not going to save us. They're not going to bring us anywhere. And so the collage of all these forces making up destiny and history, they're difficult for us to understand, but I'm trying to tell you that they are psychological, you know, the, the, the desire to conserve things, to hold things together, to maintain the status quo. It's not necessarily a political position. It is most certainly a psychological position, you know, whereas this idea to progress, it's not necessarily just this sort of anarchist left wing idea. That's a mistake to abstract politics to absolute reality. You can also progress in the sense of like, you find your animus again and then re it it demands a new expansive culture out of you and so you follow it and it leads you to something more beautiful and more unique and more yourself and so this is this is one possibility you can take towards this there's many different directions you can go and as maybe i sound like i'm critiquing the conservatives and perhaps i am but i'm not necessarily going for the political stuff here i'm talking about the problem of these psychological attitudes going into this stuff thinking you need to stiff freeze frame reality as it is and and not allow yourself to to go forward or go backwards or maybe even desire to go backwards and freeze frame everybody into like the 1950s or like the the middle of the the 13th century or something like that instead you've got to think about the energies that drive life drive culture what point are where what are you going to achieve if you're going to you know like freeze frame a culture that's long gone a basically a husk a body without a soul you know think of western culture what if our animus is gone what if we've we've castrated our animus and all that's left is this dead body you know these like this, like think of like the skeletons, all these statues, all these these buildings and all that. They're the hard matter of a, a, a the ghosts of a time long gone past. What are, what what can we do? Like what, what does that have any relevance to us? If there's no energy coming out of us, that is that is the the forgotten or the 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 old memories of something that used to be alive but is not alive anymore. And and our way, the way that we conduct it, is we reinject soul into these things, or we recreate something new with a new soul. And so we must dive down and find this again. That's what you're looking for. It's not some type of it's not some type of abstraction, being like oh we just got to worship the statues again and all that. That's 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 it's it's about finding this stuff in energetically and it's about an emotional experience an intimate experience with yourself you know what do you feel how what's your relationship with your emotions do you feel those dionysian energies and do you have a healthy relationship to them an empowering relationship do you understand how they are creative are you able to get your 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 stiff domesticated rational mind out of the way and tame it with your powerful will and allow these things to rip forward and make it make it react to them you know have you achieved this and if you have then maybe you might be the crux of something new and of course Nietzsche gives his thoughts, weighs in his thoughts on how you go about building a strong culture, the foundational thesis for how this stuff works. 
Beauty is no accident. Even the beauty of a race or a family, the charm and perfection of all its movements, is attained with pains. Like genius, it is the final result of accumulated work of generations. Great sacrifices must have been made on the altar of good taste. For its sake, many things must have been done, and much must have been left undone. The 17th century in France is admirable for both of these things. In this century, there must have been a principle of selection in respect to company, locality, clothing, and the gratification of the instinct of sex. Beauty must have been preferred to profit, to habit, to opinion, and to indolence. The first rule of all, nobody must let himself go, not even when he is alone. Good things are exceedingly costly, and in all cases the law obtains that he who possesses them is a different person from him who is acquiring them. Everything good is an inheritance. That which is not inherited is imperfect. It is simply a beginning. In Athens, at the time of Cicero, who expresses his surprise at the fact, the men and youths were far superior in beauty to the women. But what hard work and exertions the male sex had for centuries, imposed upon itself in the service of beauty. We must not be mistaken in regards to the method employed here. The mere discipline of feelings and thoughts is little, little better than nil. It is in this that the great error of German culture, which is quite illusory, lies. The body must be persuaded first. The fate of a people and humanity is decidedly according to whether they begin culture at the right place. Not at the soul, as the fatal superstition of the priests and half-priests would have it. The right place is the body. Demeanour, diet, physiology. The rest follows as the night, the day. That is why the Greeks remained the first event in culture. They knew and they did what was needed. Christianity, with its contempt of the body, is the greatest mishap that has ever befallen mankind. And so what does this mean? Does this mean that we get to own the Christians? We get to all become pagans? Not quite. Remember, Nietzsche called old Big J Christ, the Christiest J of all. He called him a noble soul. He admired him. And of course, you should. Christ is better than you. He is a, he's more famous than you anyway. His image resonates throughout history in a way that yours will never, you will be forgotten. So he is better than you. So it's one thing to criticize Christianity on that level but it's another thing to criticize the institution and of course these these stiff and um, creepy sterile old academics that get up in there you know and all they are is a disembodied left brain and it sits up there and it tries to reorganize your your mind in accordance to its own spiritually castrated image and he, he hates that institution he hates that that institution has baptized its goal its purpose its noble purpose is to improve mankind fallen mankind that's full of all these ugly degenerate fallen people who trust their instincts who have a relationship with their instincts and of course that's that's to be in a state of, of 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 lack of grace of fallenness and i as the stiff left-brained academic i am going to sever that connection you have with your instincts and save you and make you a lot like me make you castrated so you and i can be castrated together in this perfectly peaceful you know weird um um estrogenic uh, overly overweight paradise that i've created in this little this little book book this little library together with all of us whereas nietzsche says their whole first principle principle is wrong because you know these are people who are weak in spirit weak in animus and therefore weak in the vessel that carries the animus and that would be the body and so what he suggests is that if you invert if you just change if you just take that first principle and put it as the center point for the way you're going to see things it radically changes everything and what what is this first principle well it's it's that the body matters the body matters as the repository of this animus it is the vessel that this animus animus uses to enact its goals in the world it it is maybe perhaps the manifestation of this animus for all we know this energy that drives you you know this electricity that god plugged into the world it's manifesting as you as this body and this is where it all happens and those instincts that erupt out of you the the, the animus as they present themselves to you as the instincts as feelings those those emotions that anger you have that envy that sadness that happiness that joy that lust that moodiness that heartbreak all these type of things all these profound emotions that wrap around your soul and put and put together your, your reality in the most tender parts of your life and the things that you are seeking that is actually all good it's something you can trust something you must manage you cannot be a hothead about it you cannot turn into a complete Italian but you must 
on some level develop a relationship for it you cannot sever yourself off for it and think that you've achieved something that is nothing more than um, thinking that if if you want to do no fap you should cut your dick off and consider yourself very strong willed that's not how it works at all you know it's 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 not the same thing you need to be able to you need to be able to control it and drive drive it towards something productive it's the result that matters and of course these 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 academics they don't get any results you know they they say highfalutin and beautiful words things that sound nice things that entrance a lot of people who lack their instincts and have time to sit around and rationalize it is entrancing it's intoxicating to hear this stuff but it doesn't achieve anything socrates didn't save the greeks you know the greeks did end up getting conquered by the romans and alexander the great and all that these these things came afterwards there was no redemption arc it was a fall because this was the point where it was stiff and needed to understand itself in the only way it could when it had lost its instincts and so this first principle is unavoidable you can dance around it all you want but it is too brutal it is too realistic it is too accurate it's too true you know you can demonize it all you want but you're not going to get anywhere with it you're still going to lack the instincts and the instincts are degenerative power and so you 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 are stuck here you're trying to run a car without oil you know it just does not make sense and of course you might think that all right well like what, what was like it, it, it doesn't matter we'll just like it doesn't even matter in the modern world it was just Nietzsche talking against Christianity you know no not not at all he wasn't specifically going after christianity as the 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 absolute demon that caused this he's saying that it's a this this instinct is the fundamental and any society you build that lacks this is going to lack the body to whatever ideology it has and any um, society that has a lot of people with a strong animus they're going to rebaptize any ideology they have into something strong and and this is the fundamental place you should be focusing look at us now you know we are a people who really lack an animus we feel a lot of pain we're we're in tragic fallen states you, you will actually understand so much about this culture war that people are always talking about if you bring your mind down onto this level and and understand that there's uh, lots of people who are you know unhealthy they've been they, they've been eating uh, from food from a food system that has this propensity towards poisoning people they have this you know school system that, that gets them stuck in their head and sitting down all the time they're stuck in this like sedentary lifestyle they're, they're they've got metabolic syndrome from like bad about uh, from being over weight there's you know like even something as simple as their glutes don't work properly because they sit down so much they're 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 in a fallen state and you can see the mental health crisis spiraling out of control and all the psychology in the world is doing nothing for it because they're wrong on first principle and you see in this fallen state these people the body is a limitation for them it hurts them and you know you have to feel compassion for them it is tough it is tough to be trapped in this prison this vessel and this energy this animus is demanding of you this 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 life inside of you is demanding that you reach for the stars that you go for everything you try become alexander the great but but you know you know that this body would let you down it's it's hard to do that like i i see alexander the great and i feel awful i feel i feel envious i feel sad i i feel i feel down on myself his 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 profoundness makes me feel bad about myself because i know that if i tried to do something like that if i tried to like would you go out and start fighting people to, to gain territory I'd lose pretty fast because I'm not skilled enough I haven't put in enough combat training and whatnot and that actually hurts you know it hurts your feelings to realize that this person is better than you this person is better than you and actually developing the ability to admit that is a supreme virtue that is the the unresentful ability to to describe inequality in the world that is something that is so hard for people to do but this is a fundamentally a relationship you have to derive with yourself and understand that yes the the body is the thing that holds all of us back and this the source of so much resentment and so much negative energy and so much of the powerful energies that are driving our culture come from this problem the one thing we've tried to look over the body the repository of everything these people who who Jordan Peterson com complains about who want to change their gender well think about what they're saying biology is tyrannical it forces me to be something that I, I don't want to be this thing I want to be something else like literally they say my feelings my spirit you know my spirit wants me to be a man or a woman but I'm stuck in a man or a woman's body I'm stuck in the wrong body and the body is the prison the biology is this tyrannical prisoner it, it is beast that's holding it back and so there's this animus there's this will in order to to overcome the body to, to, to beat it now you might get that in something like an athlete an athlete has this desire to be high like you know this high status winner 
But of course he gets injured and then his body's holding him back and there's this hate towards this vessel. This vessel is in the way. And, and there's, we, there's no way around this. We need to develop, no, whether you're going to be a winner or, or someone like struggling with something like transsexual stuff or whatever's going on, you're going to need to develop a relationship with this body. Now, the, the one that dominates us all is the, the inevitability of death. This is the one thing that's definitely coming. The body will eventually break and we will lose. It will get diseased. It will get old. We'll fail. It's going to let us down. It's inevitably going to let us down. It's destined to let us down. And that is your destiny of all things. That, that this animus is in you for a while. You have some time to impose, to release that animus out into the world. But then it's going to go. And then the animus would dissipate into something else. It might even be consumed by someone else. If you're, if you're an animal, you have to contemplate that. This is why your fear is so deep. And so we have this challenge where it's like, how do we overcome the body? Maybe you might understand the, the emotional animus, the religious f um, fervor you see in the transhumanist movement. What is exactly happening there? Well, of course, if you look at the psychology, you see all these tech guys who are not that, you know, they wouldn't be exactly embodied people. They are people who are skinny. They are people who don't eat well. They are people who love computers. They are people who are like getting involved with computers and they see inside the computer culture, the tech culture, the possibility possibility what's the the secret religious idea the possibility that one day we're going to have a singularity where we will get dna editing and we will get the this this neural link and we will upload ourselves into um we'll upload our consciousness into a machine and this this might be a robot body or something that that will that will be immune a new vessel that will be immune to the challenges of death it will it will lift us into immortality well that is essentially christianity there is no difference between that the same thesis in christianity is that one day during the the the, the redemption the, the the real the real um, revelation the the kingdom of heaven will come down and lift us all up into heaven as everlasting souls with our perfect bodies you know and it's the same same idea that's creeping in here people have this tragedy with their body they hate their body they hate their instincts they hate everything about it and they want to escape it and it's not malicious it's a psychological mistake and Someone like Nietzsche comes and calls it out and everybody gets mad at him. They call him Gollum. They call him they call him Gollum addicted to power and all this. Then they call him Sauron. They call him a Sauruman. He's getting ready to start up the, the new Urukai army or something like that. And it's like, no, 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 no. This is just a fundamental challenge of being a person is, is dealing with the tragedy of the body. Like it is just there. It's just the, the realistic thing. And in some sense, his existentialist slant is to say that if you can develop a, 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 a connection with the animus inside the body, the, the spirit and understand its artistic goal, its artistic goal to be beautiful, to release these powerful emotions and its artistic goal to release these ambitious and, and world conquering emotions as well and allow that to breathe, that will actually lead you towards something great. Now, why do we talk about all this and what relevance does it have to fucking the everything that's going on now? It's like, Steph, yeah, as usual, like an hour and a half or something like that to, to talk about nothing. So think about in terms of culture. People are keep talking about a culture war and all this. Culture, what, we're in a culture war. So yeah, cool, cool, cool. So in order to do a culture war, well, maybe the metaphor I'd like to use is the idea of a party. You know, you're there partying with the boils, like... And then um, you can imagine everyone's, so you've got, you've got the world, because this is what we're doing. We're, we're trying to build a globalized world where we all can live together in harmony. This is, this is what's going on. So we need to live in societies where we all work together. So the idea there is that you've got a party, but the whole world is invited. And th there's this awful problem in the West in that, like, you know, you've got the, the everyone being themselves in some sense. You know, you've got the Africans winning. Get, they're really in touch with their animus. They feel they, they're proud of their instincts. They like their instincts and they just let it out. And they go out and they're, they're making all this cool music and all this type of stuff. And they're being themselves and it's awesome and whatnot and you've got the westerners you know when you've got some westerners that are that are like getting on board with that and being like oh i love this music and they're walking up and they're being like hey yo man yo brother what's up in the hood and all this and all the the kind of african dudes are kind of looking at them and like what the fuck you're not eminem only an eminem could pull that off like please stop be, like stop don't don't try be me it's weird be yourself you know that type of thing you're, you're kind of getting that look about it and then you have all the the, the rest of the westerners and they're also kind of sitting there and they're like fucking those guys think they're so cool oh oh i fucking hate their music it's not even real music oh 
oh it's it's so it's so ridiculous it's so pathetic oh and there's this 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 resentment they're sitting there in the corner and they're like you know they're like the 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 the, the loser in the back of the class they're like writing all these complicated messages to themselves just trying to figure out like you know it's like why does no one like me why am i why am i in the corner what's going on here like why 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 don't they understand morality why don't they understand why don't they understand complex sophisticated intellectual left brain theses why won't they listen to my left brain why won't they listen to my left brain and so this 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 is is a pathetic way to be, you know. And I hate seeing it. It's it's sort of like, yeah, look, I could kind of forgive you if you're like at least on the right track, but you're not. You know, you're sitting there thinking that you're gonna like left brain your way to some type of renaissance in the future, and it's like, no, never gonna happen, man. Never gonna happen. The the Africans have trusted their instincts and achieved cultural hegemony. And you know, like this is this is something that is that, that is is good for them. You know, it's it's again, it's that you have to be able to look at them like Alexander the Great and be like, all right, they won. Fair enough. Good for them that's that's good now this is not to say that like you have to just you know crawl over and die either like you you're you're allowed to win too you know you're allowed to feel good about yourself you're allowed like people might get mad at you for that but you're still allowed like it, the the biggest problem for you is you're not giving yourself permission and it's not necessarily anything more than you've just wrongly articulated where the problem will be will be solved the fact is, is that you've got all these emotions inside of you, this heart that beats, this Dionysian energy, and you deny it. And you don't want to build a relationship with that. You think you're above this stuff. You think you're better than this stuff. And and actually, this is where it's all going to come from. You, 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 you're, and like, look what you're doing, you know, you're going and you're being like a trad. You're like, all right, I'm going to, I'm going to go and I'm going to like put pictures of Alexander the Great and make videos on YouTube and I'm going to put this avatar up and I'm no better, like, I'm, I'm as bad for this stuff as anybody. And I'm going to, you know, I'm going to look at all the cathedrals from the past and all this stuff and I'm gonna, gonna we're all gonna go back one day and we're gonna revitalize Christianity and we're all gonna go back one day and it's all gonna revert and all this and and then like Jordan Peterson comes along and everyone's like yes 1950s all over again it's going back guys why pick a fence and all this we we are we are returning we are returning and it's it's like it's 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 like you you just don't understand there's there's no going back there's no going back. It's, it's a husk. It's like telling the Romans to so say, yeah, pa Roman paganism's coming back. Yeah, we're going to make Roman paganism come back. And it's like, no, it didn't. Christianity took over. The new religion came in and it changed the old religion and, and wiped it out of existence. That type of thing. And, I, and it, was, it was final. You know, it was gone. You can barely talk about it today without people being like, oh my God, heathens, no, get that stuff away. And this is the this is the reality is like if you bring it fundamental to what's going on, it's it's not ideological. It's not like, oh, you're gonna identify as a Christian or identify as something. I identify as something, therefore you've created culture. No, no, man, you can't just it's not just like magic words that come out of your left brain that, that counts as making culture. You can't just like look at stuff that was there in the past and say, I'm making culture and all this. You are the anchor point, the repository. You, this moment in time, you are the generative force. You have some instincts left in you, believe me. And if you actually develop a sophisticated, not hot-headed, but sophisticated and intelligent, right-brained relationship with these instincts, they will bring you an update. They will bring you a progress-orientated animus that will re-inject vitality in the world, that will take this husk this dead body this husk and, and breathe life into it and bring it back together and maybe it'll be some type of christian revolution maybe it'll be some type of re re reorientation of the western mind or something like that what it, but you can't plan it beforehand you you just can't do that you're not allowed to do that you didn't see the black guys when they were trapped in the very bottom rung of society feeling all resentful like 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 the westerners are now you didn't see them sitting down there and being like this is exactly how it's going to go down we're going to spend 40 years talking about how we're going to do it before we start doing anything no instead they actually just went with their feelings did block parties danced hung out and all that stuff produced culture and then they became ascendant you know jay-z and kanye are billionaires kanye is running for president you know that's that's ascendant that's cultural power that's that's them having and they did it while having fun at the same time and and this is this is the one thing I guess I would offer to this is that like you know it, it a lot of this stuff is actually farcical a lot of this stuff is actually people um, pretending they know what they're doing but they have no idea and if you wanted to if you wanted to create something if you wanted to be a generative power if you wanted to re 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 reclaim your soul 
for yourself. It would be about going into your feelings, the Dionysus, the the emotions, and 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 building up a a sophisticated relation with relationship with them, and, and approaching it in a sort of artistic way. In some sense, you can bring them out if you're an artist and present them to the world in their profoundness. And then in another way, if you're some type of a creator in a, a in an organizational uh, organizational sense or something like that, you can do the same thing. But you need to, you need to trust them. If you're if you're rationalizing against them, you're going to get nowhere. Here's here's my here's my doctrine of sterility. Get on board. Like you know, Martin Luther comes up again and starts bashing down the the the, the hip hop and being like, oh, I don't like this. Bashing down people and being like, oh, I don't like this stuff anymore. We wait, here's the here's the dogma again. Like it could happen. You know, it has happened before, but it's not like it's going to be. Well, we can't we can't lie to ourselves and say it's going to be some radical progress. You know, that will just be uh, as we said. That will be whatever horse is winning right now, getting out of control, and therefore the crude way of taming it coming back in. But our concern is about doing things right. And so as I said, in order to do things right, you must accept the first principles, see this vital energy inside of you, and connect with it. And finally, I think if you do that, you might be able to shrug off the nastiness of Nietzsche and think for yourself. And so with all that said and done, I must tell you that over on uberboyo.com, I'm doing a podcast series on nasty Nietzsche, a Nietzsche masterclass, if you will. And what I'm going to do there is discuss jargon. I'm going to do the jargon crusade, finally. I'm going to take these magic words that in, in boldness, in prisons, these, these, these left-brain intellectual magic spells, and I'm going to break them apart and show you a much more authentic and juicy and vivid way of seeing things. I'm going to show you how to do Nietzsche right. I'm going to extend what Nietzsche taught in his book, genealogy of morals and I'm going to show you how you can rebaptize so so many words to get what we call a more grounded perspective on things a more ancient perspective on things united with the more modern updated perspective on things Jung said that if you wanted to if you wanted to rediscover your values you have to actually dig down into things and of course we should do this we should we should look through history and see the nature of these words that we use and understand um, how they even make sense a great example here is the idea of so like what what does it do to you what does it damage you if you identify your soul as your left brain chatter brain consciousness if you get that wrong you will live your whole life in pain and suffering this is where these things become practical whereas if you actually get a good grip of your soul as this this energy that is passing through you something you can ride along with something you can ride with or maybe this 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 part of you that rides the 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 passionate horse inside of you maybe you will get a better inter interaction with your emotions and therefore a better life so if you're interested in that check out the link below you will get a membership to uberboyo.com and you will see the podcast there it will pop up right in whatever podcast app you're using and you'll find it incredibly juicy and there'll be dribble coming out of your mouth in lust and glory and um, beauty so thank you very much boyos talk to you later stay juicy bye bye we'll play us out with a song why not And they can say that we are evil, they can say that we are blessed But the chaos in the soul is where the music is expressed And demons move beneath me, there's angels on my breath There's magic in the air, but we're here in the flesh And soon they will feel it The crowd moves as one, like an ocean from the midst Giving birth to the sun The day has come, heart beats like a drum Leaving us stunned as we're looking up above And the poetry it cuts like lightning through the night energy all shivers up your spine and your eyes shine like the stars and we know the moments ours when we see our souls traveled in the cross every year let it go let it fall apart look above know that you are living in a work of art made of love and you live and your scars are a kiss and your heart's not a bit so put some faith in it see the stars of forever they flow follow wherever we go and though we will never be home Till we find ourselves right here And more than ever we know That the stars are forever in flow And we just need to believe so I'm saying to you That the tapestry we paint over everywhere we roam Is the story of a boy who is searching the unknown And Dionysus lives in everyone who rolls And he is calling on us all to simply let go But still we tell ourselves Knowledge is control But all it does is decorate the stone that we roll Then every day we search Cause we need to know But here you found yourself 
Cause the truth's in the flow And the earth it shakes while it lies in wait And your eyes they dilate as they shine out from your face And you have found your place cause you found your grace And the spirits all unite and they say that you are saved And if it's all a game then we were born to play It's time to walk the way and throw our scorn at our shame And never more will we point and blame Cause we know that hate makes you a slave And we see that the stars are forever in flow Follow wherever we go And though we will never be home Till we find ourselves right here And more than ever we know That the stars are forever in flow And we just need to believe Here we go And we see that the stars are forever in flow Follow wherever we go And know we will never be home Till we find ourselves right here And more than ever we know That the stars are forever in flow We just need to believe